Uh, welcome at this session about uh, tipping points in nature by Professor Dr. Uh, Ingeur Max Rietkerk. Um, you're, uh, you're over there. C can we turn off the music, perhaps? I still hear some... This yes, that's better. Thank you very much. Um, Max Rietkerk uh, studied uh, and did his PhD uh, at the Wageningen University. Um, he did field research in Burkina Faso and Tanzania. And nowadays he is a full professor at the University of Utrecht in spatial ecology and global change. Those are two very important and interesting themes. Um, Max does research uh, into vegetation patterns, uh, plant soil feedbacks. We will see some very interesting uh, examples of this. Biodiversity, ecological complexity, global change, catastrophic shifts. Uh, resilience and of course tipping points that's the subject of this uh, this evening um, a tipping point is a uh, correct me if i'm wrong max but you will explain it much better but to do it very shortly is a rather drastic and often irreversible change of an ecosystem for instance of a savanna turning into a desert um, max and his colleagues made a very important uh, discovery they discovered that complex systems like savannas, for instance, or even our whole climate, um, can avoid tipping points. Um, so they are far more resilient to catastrophic changes than, than expected. That's uh, one of your findings, and that's very interesting, I think. So, Max, please, the floor is yours. Go ahead with the, the tipping points. Yeah? Thank you very much, uh, yep. Peter. You're you, welcome. You almost explained everything. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming to this uh, lecture and to the discussion. Um, my name is Max Rietkerk. I work at the Copernicus Institute uh, at Utrecht University. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to visit my colleagues here in, uh, in Twente. Uh, I have two messages for tonight, so that should be okay to uh, memorize. Uh, one is do look up. I will explain that in a minute. And the other one is do not be afraid for the tipping point. And I will explain that too, of course. And basically those two messages were inspired by the, those th these two uh, movies. Let me check if I can use the pointer. Uh, with do look up, I mean to say, uh, don't look away to, to, uh, for dangerous uh, climate change and for necessary climate action, as these guys here do look away for the dangerous impact of a comet that approaches Earth, right? So my uh, message is, do not look away for dangerous climate change. And the second message uh, basically is inspired by this movie, Breaking Boundaries, which is basically using the theory of tipping points uh, as a motivation for climate action. And this is a motivation that I uh, put a question mark behind. And I will explain that in this, uh, in this lecture. So why uh, not to be afraid for the tipping point? And that is basically uh, written here. The reason for that is that climate and ecosystems are robuster than we previously thought. And I started out my research uh, back in the 90s. And uh, back then, uh, this theory of catastrophic shifts and tipping points uh, came up and became very popular. And a lot of examples appeared in the literature. And this is how this uh, theory of tipping points started out, basically. And this has been uh, developing, of course, uh, in time until, uh, until today. And I will explain this development uh, in this lecture. But before, before going further, First of all, I would like to explain what a tipping point is. And for that, uh, a student of mine made a very nice movie about regime shifts or catastrophic shifts in ecosystems. Those are all the similar, similar terminology for the same thing, for the tipping point. And it is explained in this movie. So please take three minutes to, uh, to watch this movie. Imagine an ecosystem, for example, a savanna, 
this ecosystem is in a certain state, described for example by the amount of vegetation. This state is stable. This means that if we introduce a disturbance, the ecosystem will grow back to the way it was. If environmental conditions change, for example if it becomes drier, this may change how the ecosystem responds to disturbances. The so-called stability landscape may change, introducing the possibility of a second stable state. In this example of a savanna, the second stable state is a desert state, with little or no vegetation. Under these environmental conditions, only a very large disturbance can cause the ball to roll from one stable state to the other. So the system is resilient to disturbances. If environmental conditions change further, it becomes easier to go from one state to the other. Now, only a minor disturbance can already push the ecosystem from a vegetated to a desert state. A further change in environmental conditions might even remove the possibility of a vegetated state altogether. Close to this tipping point, the system is less resilient. This shift from one state to the other is rapid, compared to environmental conditions that were actually changing relatively slowly. In order to restore the state with vegetation, the environment now needs to become much wetter than it was right before the shift occurred. So we should be careful with changing and disturbing our ecosystems. Their response to environmental changes and disturbances is unpredictable and shifts in ecosystem states are difficult, if not impossible, to restore. Okay, so far about uh, tipping points. Uh, and from uh, this tipping point theory, this very well-known figure uh, came about to explain uh, basically the dynamics that uh, this movie showed, right? What we call a ball and cup analogy, analogy with the stability landscape that changes when environmental conditions change, and then a tipping point may occur and the system may change irreversibly almost. That is the whole idea about tipping points. And here in this figure, you see the two tipping points in red, in which where one stable state suddenly switches to another stable state, uh, which is then, again, difficult to reverse. And of course, if one thinks about uh, ecosystems, and if you think, for example, about savannas uh, changing into a desert, uh, this is a dangerous transition, and one would like to know before when such a transition happens. And that is a notorious difficult thing to predict because when, approach oops. because when approaching a tipping point, not much change is happening, right? And then only at the tipping point there is a drastic change. So the whole world, the whole scientific world, is basically now looking at signs. How can we tell how close we are to a tipping point in, the, in order that we can prevent it? So that is uh, so-called the holy grail now in this, uh, in this field of research, so to say. And in my own research, I've been concentrating quite a bit on, uh, on dry ecosystems, dry savannas. And what happens there, and this is basically the general mechanism behind, behind uh, catastrophic shift, is positive feedback, is self-propelling change. So once the change begins, it is very difficult to reverse because it's enhanced by a certain process. And in this uh, dry savanna ecosystems, the process is depicted in this figure over here, in that if vegetation cover increases, the water that infiltrates into the soil as a consequence of rainfall also increases drastically, because the vegetation forms roots and enhances the soil organisms and things like that. And the rainwater can much better infiltrate when there is vegetation 
as compared when there is no vegetation. So basically the vegetation enhances its own environment. And the more vegetation there is, the happier the vegetation is and the more they can grow. And this is the positive feedback in this kind of dryland ecosystem, so to say. And when you make elegant mathematical models about that, the outcome is exactly that tipping point behavior as I just explained. In which, for example, here you have a decreasing amount of rainfall fall, and the system doesn't change much. It's quite green and everything looks happy, right? But as soon as you, the tipping point comes, the system may collapse and then there is a desert. And it's very difficult to reverse the desert because when you once you have a bare ground and soil erosion, if, for example, a seed, fall on, a seed fall on the, falls on the ground, it is very easily washed away by erosion and it's very difficult to regenerate. So this is how I started my research. I did a lot of field work in uh, Burkina Faso, for example, in Africa and in Tanzania, in which I, me in which I measured this, uh, this relation. And for some plants, this can really, if you see here, there, this is a specific kind, a specific group of plants that can really increase their own water infiltration eightfold. So that is really a big process, so to say. Actually, the, the, the tipping point theory also is embedded in the theory of uh, catastrophes, catastrophe theory. And I don't know, know who is familiar with that, but catastrophe theory go goes back to uh, René Tom, a mathematician uh, from uh, France, a French mathematician. And actually, this mathematician is, uh, was friends with uh, this guy over here. You recognize him? No one? Salvador Dali. So Salvador Dali uh, actually visited a, lot, visited a lot of conferences and uh, he was really involved in the scientific community and he was uh, personal friends with uh, René Tom. <coughs> and you see here exactly the same catastrophic shift I just explained with the tipping points over here and over here. And actually this was the last painting uh, he made uh, in honor of his friend uh, René Tom after which he catastrophically died. Anyhow, I was telling that uh, one of the things that scientists uh, are looking for now is uh, so-called called early warning signals. So uh, can we see uh, at the system and can we predict how close we are to such tipping points? And I started to, uh, to look at the, this dryland ecosystem and to model that and also to model that in a spatially explicit way in which I incorporated spatial processes. So the water does not only infiltrate uh, right into the soil, but if it does not infiltrate, it can, of course, flow somewhere else and infiltrate somewhere else. And this very simple concept already changed uh, the whole theory, uh, because uh, instead of those uh, uh, tipping points, what also occurred in the, in the models, and also, uh, as I will show, in real system, is that specific patterns start to occur. And this is what is depicted here, that before the tipping point occurs, another point can occur, what we call the Turing point. And the Turing point is basically also a mechanism of instability, what causes specific spatial patterns. And back then, which was already quite some time ago, we thought that these spatial patterns uh, were basically indicative of such a tipping point. So once you see those patterns, you say, you say oh, be careful, we approach a tipping point, point, how can we avoid that? But as we uh, uh, did further research and our mathematics became more sophisticated, this actually also changed drastically our ideas. But first I would like you to show the patterns that they also uh, occur in reality. So these, these kind of patterns, they occur at almost every edge of the desert all around the world. So if you go to Google Earth, it is not difficult to find uh, all those kind, different kind of quite regular patterns. So these are these kind of Turing patterns uh, about which we thought 
would be indicative of a catastrophic shift or indicative of certain tipping points. And these are the models that we uh, make, and actually they indeed look very similar to the, to the patterns in nature. And the only thing we incorporated here was this simple mechanism that more plants means more water. That's all, and you can generate all those patterns. So you can basically uh, tune your model, and you can uh, increase the rainfall a bit, or increase the grazing a bit, and you can manipulate these kind of patterns that you then also can see in reality. And how these patterns come about is what we call scale-dependent feedback. So I just uh, explained positive feedback, which means uh, more plants, more water, and the plants are happy, so they can grow better, which means more water. But in a spatial context, this works a little bit different. And this is explained in the next short movie that I will show. We all know that plants need water and that they take up water with their roots. Plants have developed a clever trick to transport water from their roots to their leaves. Their leaves have tiny openings through which water evaporates. Because water exits the plant at the top, it is replaced by water from below. And this sucking effect is similar in the soil. Near the roots, water is removed from the soil, and this water is replaced by water from the surrounding area. So plants literally suck their surrounding soil dry. In an environment that is already dry, this extra drying of the soil can really limit plant growth. We call this a negative feedback because the plant has a negative effect on its own growth. Plants also create a positive feedback. Their roots act like channels through which water can infiltrate easily into the soil. Especially in a dry environment, this can hugely benefit the plant's own growth, hence a positive feedback. There's something interesting about these feedbacks. If you look closely, you can see that the negative feedback is on a larger scale than the positive feedback. While water is depleted from the whole area, water infiltration is only stimulated around the roots. So these feedbacks are scale-dependent. We can analyze these scale-dependent feedbacks using a diagram. First, we measure the average water content of the soil in the entire area. Then, we measure the water content in the soil at increasing distance from the plant. The diagram now shows where the water content is above average, a positive feedback, and where it is below average, a negative feedback. Because every plant has the same positive and negative feedbacks, if they are grown together, they organize into a characteristic pattern. So the effect that one single organism has on its local environment causes patterns that can cover a whole savanna. And it's not just plants that have this effect on their environment, but many other organisms create skill-dependent feedbacks too. So next time you're enjoying nature, Watch out for some skill-dependent feedbacks. So those uh, skill-dependent feedbacks can explain uh, not only those patterns in drylands and dry savannas, but also in other ecosystems, because there are many mechanisms underlying those skill-dependent feedbacks. And the skill-dependent feedback uh, in, uh, in these dryland ecosystems work also like this. Is that here, where the plants are, there is a lot of water infiltration. So here the plants are happy with their neighbors. And also the water falls here and it cannot infiltrate in between those patches. And then the water flows towards those patches and can then infiltrate there. So actually, those plants here are happy with each other and they like to be neighbors, but those patches, they compete for the water in between. And this is basically how you get uh, those, those regular patterns 
that you can see uh, in nature. And actually we call those patterns uh, Turing patterns because the first uh, uh, mathematician in this uh, case who discovered those patterns was uh, Alan Turing. And Alan Turing basically uh, uh, thought about a chemical reaction <coughs> that only consisted of activation and diffusion and he invented a theoretical chemical reaction which formed patterns. And that is very counterintuitive because uh, the diffusion per definition goes against gradients because particles move against gradients of concentration. But if you have uh, two components and one component diffuses much faster than the other component, actually patterns can occur and remain stable. And it only was decades after his first paper that he explained theoretical that these patterns could occur that the chemical reaction was uh, performed in the lab showing that Turing was right. And now we see his pattern all over the place, basically. So these scale-dependent feedbacks uh, in nature occur uh, quite often uh, and uh, are not so difficult to, to find, as uh, exemplified in this, uh, in this figure. And as we worked uh, further on a theoretical uh, uh, way to explain these patterns and also to connect them with these tipping points, we found a little bit different or uh, a very much different result recently in that those patterns, they are very stable in itself. So first we thought that those patterns would be indicative of tipping points, but once we had a toolbox to analyze the stability of those patterns, then we discovered that, that those patterns themselves were very stable. And this is uh, exemplified by, by what we call the Busse balloon, and you see here the Turing point and the tipping point. And the Busse balloon goes all the way around, <laughs> goes all the, way around the tipping point, right? And the, the patterns there remain, remain very stable and very stip, sticky, until basically the last patch dies out and nothing is left. So instead of having this sudden tipping point, you have this whole range of patterns that you can expect that may remain quite stable in nature. And instead of the sudden shift and the hysteresis loop, the sudden shift is basically gone and is replaced by small shifts. And the restoration is also basically uh, replaced by much smaller shift and much closer to the decay as compared to where it was in this figure, where it was here, right? The hysteresis loop was here. Now the, the hysteresis loop is gone because of all these spatial processes. And once we saw this in the models, we also thought about uh, different observations that we could do to relate to these models. And this is basically uh, two things which we can learn from this, what we call Busse balloon. Is this what we see here? It's because this is a different environmental conditions, right? So here you go from, for example, wet to dry. And patterns, they can remain stable for quite a range of environmental conditions. So from that we could predict that if environmental conditions change, maybe the pattern stays the same, right? Maybe the pattern is very resilient to that change. So that was an idea to look at real systems to see if that happens, right? And the other thing seems counterintuitive, but is not. It's related, it's basically the different side of the same coin, is that given one certain environmental condition, this Busse balloon is quite large. So you can expect also different patterns given the same condition. So first, the same pattern with changing conditions and different pattern with the same conditions. Right? So with that in mind, we could look at specific systems and see what happens in one location in time and see whether this theory fits. And this is what we did uh, with quite a, a number of people because it involved quite some ex expertise. Uh, 
not only the mathematics, which is quite complicated, for which we need really people that, that, that are specialized in the stability of patterns, for example, which is a whole field in, uh, in mathematics. And then the ecologists, and then we had the data people that basically were specialists in remotely sensed data to observe the patterns that I just explained. And then uh, we went, well, not physically, but uh, with remote sensing data to, uh, to the Horn of Africa, to Somalia, in which you have really, again, if you go back home to tonight and you go behind Google Earth and you look here, you see like kilometers and kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of those patterns. And we took two areas and we analyzed those patterns, how they looked like and how they evolved in time. And we related that uh, to models. So we could model this simple system and we could predict, in this case, we had slope, slope as an environmental condition because remember, we depict two different areas and of course for, for that area, the environmental condition that change is, uh, for example, slope, not rainfall because it's one area. So in this case, we changed slope. And then we could see, we could generate in the model all kinds of patterns which is which what we call wa different wave numbers. So different uh, numbers of stripes per square area, for example. And we could relate that to real data in which we indeed confirmed that given a specific slope, we could find a whole range of different patterns in that area. And if you take a picture of that from above, it looks like this. So you see that within one area, you find stripes with a very long wavelengths, but also with shorter wavelengths, and all kinds of different patterns with one, within one spatial area. And actually, those patterns, they can remain stable for decades, even if environmental conditions change. So this basically confirmed uh, our theory. And actually, with this picture, we could say that we found a Busse balloon in nature. The Busse balloon that we generated by our model. So, because of this, we actually uh, changed the theory on tipping points. Uh, remember, we started it out like this. Uh, and this related to a dynamics like this, with the tipping point here and restoring the system here. But now we have these patterns here that basically clearly avoid tipping points. So this, this is how, come, how I come to the theory of avoiding tipping. So real nature can avoid tipping by, in this case, forming spatial patterns. And this hysteresis loop basically disappears because of this Busse balloon. But this is actually only uh, half of the story, or probably even less than half of the story, because there is another thing that I would like to, uh, to emphasize. And that is the following. You remember this picture from, uh, from earlier, that you have a catastrophic shift in which one stable state changes into another, and then we, you go back, the system is basically caught in that, that other state and only can come back here. Well, we ask ourselves, yeah, but why? Why would there only be one stable state? Who, who in or even two? Why would there be only two stable states? So we thought, is it possible that we can find both states in the same area? So why, why, why should there be only one state? Why, sh why can, not, can, can not there be two states in the same area? So could there be disturbances that would change one state to the other, and in space you would see both stable state, states, but then in a pattern, in a spatial pattern? And this is basically uh, uh, the theory that we spelled out in a recent paper that we published last year in Nature that uh, if you look at uh, savanna ecosystems, you indeed see that at the edge of the tropical forest, uh, 
you see both states within one area, right? And in theory, there is a theory that those tropical forests and savannas are tipping, right? I mean, uh, I don't know if you have heard about the Amazon tipping into a savanna, and uh, there's a lot of uh, science about that. But uh, we should not forget, I think, that the savanna and the tropical forest can just uh, exist in the same area. And the same, counts for, and the same theory counts for savanna woodland and savanna, in which you have really savannas that are quite wooded with savanna trees or consisting of grass. And also here, you have these different stable states within one area. And we call those coexistence states. So basically, and this is not the only uh, coexistence states that are observed in nature. A recent paper actually confirmed this. And also, if you think about the atmosphere, and if you think about ocean currents, in which also this kind of tipping dynamics are uh, predicted, if you think about the, the, the Gulf Stream, for example, but also in lakes, and if you think about ice that is basically uh, occurring together with water, those are also uh, coexistence states. And for all of these systems, there is a whole lot of theory underlying that uh, basically uh, predicts tipping points. And the question now is, when does real tipping occur, or when does the system basically uh, change into spatial patterns? And then at what scale does this tipping occur? So actually, the, the, the story is much more complex than uh, a system can tip from one state into the other and then cannot, rever cannot be reversible. So we could actually expand the whole theory and also include these tipping points in the theory and, or these uh, coexistence states, and they basically occur in the area where, where two stable states are stable. So we think you do, not see, you do not see a state either being black or being white. No, you, say, you see all kinds of patterns in reality in which those two stable states uh, co-occur. And actually, those coexistent states, if the conditions change, can then again fall apart into these Turing patterns, which is exemplified by this picture over here that I took fr from Google Earth. Google Earth is a great resource that you see a savanna here that is basically forming a touring pattern and coexists with a desert, which is basically a picture that falls here into this phase diagram, into the theoretical model. And if you put that all together in one figure, in which the tipping point here is so predominant and defines the whole dynamics of the whole system, where is the tipping point gone? Well, you can find it here, but I mean, it is, uh, it is surrounded by all kinds of complex behavior, and the whole tipping behavior is basically gone in the theory that we developed. And remember, this is about systems that started out the theory with, of tipping points. So if you look further into the theory, a whole lot of other things happen, and there are a large range of conditions for which that tipping behavior is completely vanished. So then if you move up a bit in scale and uh, leave the, the ecosystem a little bit behind and go to the climate system, there is a lot of tipping elements predicted in the climate system as well. And this is started out by a work uh, of Tim Lenton from Exeter University in, the sta in, uh, in England. And for example, most prominent are the ice sheets, the polar ice sheets, in which you also have a positive feedback, right? The positive, feed be being, the positive feedback being the radiation, because uh, uh, white ice reflects radiation, right? And dark water absorbs radiation. So the more ice disappears, the warmer it will be, the more the ice melts, and you have a positive feedback. And indeed, if you look at it at this 
in this framework at systems on the whole earth, you find all kinds of positive feedbacks all over the place. And you can basically hypothesize tipping for a lot of large tipping elements across the globe. Also the Amazon rainforest, in which you have uh, a rainfall feedback, because the more forest there is, the more water it transpires and the more rainfall it can generate, right? And you have a positive feedback. And there is also uh, tipping point behavior predicted for the Atlantic Surmer Highline Circulation, which is the warm Gulf Stream, basically, that the warm Gulf Stream can flip and disappear and the climate worldwide will change. Well, and so on. I could uh, go on uh, uh, forever, uh, I think, uh, with this. Now, the question is, um, well, at least for me, the question is, you can, you can hypothesize all these uh, tipping points, but uh, do those tipping points hold in the very complex climate models, in the most sophisticated clima climate models that we have and that we uh, are now uh, uh, analyzing also for uh, the IPCC uh, analysis. And for the IPCC, they also uh, uh, analyze what they call shared socio-economic pathways, what are basically different scenarios for emissions. And there is a lot of uh, uh, climate models around, uh, changing and with different kind of complexities and different kind of components involved, with or without ocean, with or without vegetation, different complexities. But there is a lot of effort going on to compare all those models and to analyze uh, where we can find those tipping points, right? And uh, one first effort was by Drijfhout uh, et al. And basically, he analyzed 37 models and three scenarios till 2100. So this is uh, just a short calculation, 37 models times three scenarios. He does, that's about 100 runs, right? And then what they found in terms of the iconic tipping points that are all over the place and everybody believes in. This forest dieback in the Amazon, that you can read a lot about, occurs in two models from the 37, but only for one scenario, which is the 85 scenario, which is the most drastic emission scenario from which the IPCC says it's unrealistic. The boreal forest expansion, which is the tundra, tundra becoming a, a forest instead of a tundra, occurs in one model, out of 37, for one scenario, also the most unrealistic scenario. There is abrupt vegetation greening predicted in the Sahel because of uh, the increase of CO2, which is basically a resource for vegetation, occurring in one model for three scenarios. The winter sea ice collapse, I find this one uh, quite interesting because I always think this winter sea ice collapse is a real prominent potential tipping point, right? Because of this dominant feedback of white and black reflecting or absorbing radiation. So that's a positive feedback, right? Well, the winter sea ice collapse in five models. OK, so that's quite a bit of models. Oh, one scenario, the most unrealistic one, right? From which the IPCC says it's unrealistic. And then actually I verified this with experts on, uh, on these models, actually one of the co-authors of this uh, paper. And he said, yeah, but uh, this could happen in all models for the most unrealistic scenario. And then he referred to this paper, and I read that paper, and the tipping point there uh, did not occur because of a tipping point, because of positive feedback, because, but because of specific melting and freezing dynamics in different seasons in time. So there was indeed uh, ice collapses, but there was no real tipping point in my view, because it was completely reversible. And the, the, the feedback was not there in the model. And then there is this convection collapse, which is the warm Gulf Stream that uh, would suddenly collapse. And that's occurring in one model out of 37 for sea scenarios. So my point here is basically 
well, don't be afraid of a tipping point. Like, there may be abrupt changes, uh, there may be tipping points even, and we should be aware of them. And there are also, in the models, there are conditions for real tipping points. But uh, the most sophisticated, complex models do not provide so much evidence for all these large-scale tipping points. And then the theory goes further in the literature. You remember the tipping elements that I depicted uh, at different places of the Earth. Now, now the, current <laughs> the current trend is tipping cascades. Because, of course, these tipping elements, they are in one way or the other connected to each other. And one positive feedback can trigger the other positive feedback. And basically, the whole world can collapse. And this is uh, uh, work that is ongoing. And uh, specifically, uh, work ongoing is the, the connection between... Indeed, there is a connection between this melting of the ice and the weakening of the war warm Gulf Stream, because there is cold water being melted in the warm... Of course, it has an effect, right? So that the effect is being analyzed and being uh, investigated is, of course, uh, uh, very useful. And this could then be connected to dieback of the Amazon, and there could be a whole collapse of the whole world, right? Uh, 